Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. I was checking my statistics and it turns out that only one of you guys aren't subscribed. So if you don't want to be the one holdout, make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons down below. That said, our first story of the day is by Shaviria. Manager told me to replace a hard drive over a phone with a user who'd been known to screw it up or quit. So I quit. This was back in 2018. I was trying to find a job and I was getting desperate. I ended up getting a temporary job at a call center that did tech support for pharma sales reps. The first six months were fine. My contract kept getting renewed and it was going fine. They even onboarded a new client and I got to know them and they were wonderful. I ended up having a good relationship with them. As time went on, things were going a bit south. Things that we normally would not do, we ended up doing. As an example, doing hardware replacements over the phone and we were bending over backwards for the OG client. The reason why was because contract negotiations were coming up, so they were trying to make themselves look good. So much so that the second client was going to the wayside, so I was one of the few who handled their tech tickets for the second client. They were very appreciative. Not to mention at this time, layoffs happened to some of the best people, and the trainer who trained me was also laid off. I never got told why. At my one year mark at the company, a user who had been known to fry laptops called in. His hard drive had failed and wanted it fixed. He was told he'd need to send the laptop in, but he didn't want to. The agent sent him a hard drive and told him someone would walk him through it. Background on this guy is he fried other laptops doing this because he wouldn't listen and that agent always got fired. My boss told me I would need to be the one to do it and I expressed concern and told him I didn't feel comfortable doing it. He told me to try and it'll go fine. I told him there was no way I was doing it. He then said I would need to do it or quit my job. I told him, fine, I quit. He then tried to talk me out of it and I shut it down. I told him I was quitting and I turned in my company stuff. The second client reached out to me a week later asking what happened, so I told them the truth. What I did not realize was they were also in contract negotiations. So they pulled their contract and went to another outsourcer. So did the first company I found out. That first company was one of their bigger clients, so losing that hurt them. I don't know what really happened to anyone after that. It might not seem too exciting, but this was my malicious compliance I had. If a place from top to bottom seems dysfunctional or maybe like a sinking ship, but your job there seemed to be going just fine, would you still be proactive and put feelers out there to see what other opportunities exist? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Our next story is by Re Eh. Boss, a CD-ROM is a little more delicate than VHS tapes. I worked at a micro-franchised video store. They briefly rented CD-ROM games before they discovered it wasn't profitable. Every location sent their stock to our location to sell used. The procedure for selling used VHS tapes was to use a heat gun to soften the glue on our barcode sticker just enough for the easy peel. At the start of my shift, I was told to strip the CD-ROMs. On the second CD-ROM, I noticed any amount of heat warped the CD and would render it unplayable. I pointed this out to my autocratic manager and was met with, No excuses, shut up and do it. Only a little less nice. I estimate I did $12,000 to $15,000 worth of lost revenue in that 4 hour shift. Update and more info, it was the late 90s when VHS stores were king and CD-ROMs were a thing. There was no fallout for me, I wasn't the only, just the only one to notice the foolishness. VHS tapes are rather resilient and can handle 8 to 10 seconds of hot. An afternoon on the dashboard? No. Get one of those once a week in the summer, a $130 accident. There was no fallout for customers, my next shift was half a week later, and we weren't selling any. I wasn't asking. Bonus, conspiracy theory that diminishes the malicious compliance triumph. Owners might have ordered them accidentally destroyed and a write-off. Anyone that wanted Roller Coaster Tycoon probably already had it. Okay, first of all, the fact that OP had the gall to say Roller Coaster Tycoon being okay to damage or disregard because everybody already has it. The Roller Coaster Tycoon series is a treasure and will always be appreciated to me. Definitely the worst thing about used anything are the stickers that are rampant all over whatever it is. You wish that there was some kind of standardized sticker that peels off really easily, but there's plenty of cheap ones where you rip it and it's just papery, sticky mess left all over the cover. It's no fun. Our next story is by Basmoth. Oh, you want me to follow your route sheet to the letter? I work pest control. I do Centricon, checking our termite monitors. There's been several houses that have monitors covered by tarp, then dirt, and a lot of mulch. 
I'm never scheduled enough time to do the job how it needs to be done. I give my concerns and I'm told it needs to be done regardless of the conditions of the house. I explained several times that I would need most of my day to successfully find every monitor, but it's just ignored. So a triple house comes up again. I ignore giving my concerns about the house. So I go and spend hours to make sure I've located and checked every station. I get a call from my office that I spent too much time at one place. I explain that they want to ignore me about the issue and told them they told me to stay until it's done regardless of the conditions. I explain to the customer, who I do have a good relationship with, the customer calls and tells him he has a lot covering the monitors and will cancel his account if not everything is found. Office finally shuts up about times and told me to take my time and not worry about other stops until the job is done. Yeah, I would go out on a limb and say if you're hiring somebody to do any kind of servicing, maintenance, whatever, you'd want them to take the time to do everything properly and as well as they can. I hope whatever higher ups realized how bad it looked when OP had to call the customer up and say, yeah, so they're giving me a hard time about how long I spent at your place because I wanted to make sure I did a good job. Probably a great way to make people backpedal. This next story is by Quilupaluk. I was asked to read a language I didn't understand by a manager. To set the scene, I worked in a correctional facility with a majority indigenous population being residents as a relief front desk clerk. I'm half indigenous and unfortunately understand little of my cultural language. Although I can read and write in the alphabet used for this language called syllabics. A resident had written a note in syllabics and staff were trying to figure out what it had meant. My manager assumed I understood the language and asked me to read the note. I'm sometimes a smart bud and decided to go with it. I read slowly and when I'm halfway through the note, I looked up and said, you know I don't understand a word I'm saying, right? He half scoffed, half smiled while saying, give me that, and grabbed the note from my hands. It's not a high malicious compliance story, but it made me chuckle. Still gradually working on learning my cultural language. Got better at reading syllabics though. Our next story is by Ladder Chemical 7937. Either a dog lives in this house or I live. Okay. So this incident happened between me and my father about 11 years ago. My father used to work in sales for an international company. Due to the nature of his job, our family had to relocate constantly every two to three years, sometimes even to other cities and states. Because of this, I never had a close group of friends. It wasn't a big deal initially as my sister used to live with us and I always had someone to talk with. But when she moved out for her college studies, I started to get bored alone at home. My mother tried her best to make me feel not alone but, as you know, a teenager is rebellious by nature and wouldn't like talking about stuff happening with them to their mom. To overcome this, I suggested that we adopt a dog. Now, my mother had had a pet dog before her marriage, so she was all for it. But my father was extremely against the idea. He had developed a fear of dogs since his childhood, and his stance on a pet dog was as firm as a line on a rock. We went back and forth regarding this. I explained how a dog would be a great companion for me, and it could really help me get out of the house more. I wasn't an outdoor kid since I didn't have friends other than those in school. In the end, my father gave me a final warning. Either a dog lives in this house, or I'll live in this house, implying that he'd leave us if I brought home a puppy. Now, here's where the malicious compliance lies. In my native language, there's two separate words for both male and female dog. We speak Marathi, a regional language in India. Since dad said he doesn't want a male dog in the house, my mother and I went and adopted a female dog for ourselves. When my father realized how I followed his threat to the letter for my advantage, He got angry at first, but told me that I'd be responsible for everything the puppy does and I have to care for her from now on. After 11 years, my dad still tells the story to everyone about how I brought home a puppy just to mess with him and how proud he is of me because of it. Also, he no longer has a fear of dogs and continues to spoil our dog to this day. If there's a tale as old as time, it's a father that says, no, we're not going to have any pets, we're not going to have any dogs. And then you flash forward to the dog and the father being the best of friends. From my experience, I'm led to believe a lot of times it's motivated by the long-term aspect and not necessarily just it's a 10 or 15 year commitment, but that experience you have at the end of it. If you ever experience losing a pet, it's like losing a family member. It's just, when you put it that way, it's not hard to understand the apprehension. Though like OP said, in this case it was just a fear of dogs, so maybe it was a good thing they got over the fear of dogs hopefully. 
Our next story is by King Neptune 7 Won't let me go home? Okay, can't make me work. This story isn't mine but a co-worker on my ship. The shipping company I used to work for would do crew changes in the US. The ships were on a liner route and would eventually make it back to the United States where crew members would swap out. However, I then got a new job where the ships weren't on liner service. So usually your relief would be flown out to whatever country you were in. It usually ended up being a nightmare with schedule changes, messed up flights, etc. One colleague was severely overdue. The company sent a relief out to take his place so he could get sent home. The company also has a policy that vacancies need to be filled before overdue reliefs. However, they were waiving this for the engineer in question and sending him a relief first, then filling the vacancy later. The relief gets there and the guy does turnover, teaching him all the specifics, etc. The offgoing engineer asks, okay, when is my flight? The chief engineer tells him, oh, sorry, actually, we're not letting you go. We need to wait for the company to send a second relief because I used that guy to fill your vacancy. You need to stay here. Needless to say, the third engineer was pissed. I think he already had scheduled a vacation with his family, like Disneyland or something. Anyway, the ship got underway to sea and he was still there. Around 10 a.m. one day, I went to the officer's lounge to get a cup of coffee and chill for a few minutes. I saw that guy sitting in the lounge in his pajamas watching the news. And the next day, and the next day? Instead of working, he decided to just watch TV and nap all day. He said, yeah, my relief is here. As far as I'm concerned, my job is complete. They cannot get me a flight, but they can't make me work. After a few days of this, the chief engineer actually tried to give the third engineer a disciplinary. He called him into his office and berated him. The next day, the company called the chief engineer in the middle of the night, daytime in America, and basically said, what the freak are you doing? Let him go now. The disciplinary didn't go through. He got flown off in the next port, and he continued to draw overdue relief pay and salary those days he wasn't working. Edit. I also wanted to mention that the third assistant engineer was already overdue for relief. I think he was already two months over when this occurred and that this was pre-COVID before the pandemic began. So he was already supposed to be home, then he got a name and he was told when your relief shows up, you're being flown back to your home of record. He told his wife and family he was coming home, but then they pulled the rug out from under him at the last minute. I don't know what anybody above OP's co-worker was thinking, but imagine anybody working in such a far out place and being told, all right, you're going to be able to go back home. Here's when you're going to be able to go back home. You get excited, you get worked up, you get plans prepared, your relief shows up and hey, by the way, you got to stay here till we send another guy out. We don't know when that's coming. Yeah, I think they made a bit of an oopsie there. And our final story of the day is by EvilHag420 keep my hands clean? Okay. So an old friend of mine recently moved back to our home state with his wife and decided to throw a housewarming party. Of course, they got drinks and snacks. One of the items being a tray of cupcakes that got kind of banged up on the ride home. This is all important, I promise. My boyfriend and I went to the party and had a blast. More of the guests came little by little. Everyone was having a great time. Then one of the guests went for the cupcakes. There was frosting everywhere on the container. Said guest then decided to make a bet with everyone that if anyone can get a cupcake without getting their hands dirty, he'll pay $100. But if you do get frosting on your hands, you owe him $100. Now, everyone who's reading this is probably already seeing where this is going, but you've read this far, so... I stepped up and asked him, I just have to keep my hands clean, right? He nodded and chuckled, wishing me luck. I shove my face onto the closest cupcake to the edge, I'm not going to ruin the cupcakes for everyone, and lo and behold, a small cupcake is in my mouth. Everyone laughed and high-fived me, including the guy who had made the bet. He's now paying me $2 for the next few years. It was a really fun party. I would love if OP made sure to stay on top of that $2 for the next few years. Hey, uh, I don't mean to bother you, but... Spend another year and you haven't given me my $2 for that cupcake incident. Can I be expecting that over the mail or Venmo, PayPal? Honestly though, it's a great story to be able to share. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. 
Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.